Good evening, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here as part of the program. And uh, I once again want to thank uh, iHouse and the Shahanis for uh, being such wonderful hosts. And uh, I've had a, a wonderful week. So this is my last day, and it's uh, a great way to end the last day. Uh, I've been to Japan uh, maybe seven or eight times. I love this country. And uh, every time I come back, I wish I should be coming back more often. Uh, but uh, maybe next year more often. So the topic is uh, changing India through business law and women. And uh, it's a topic with many different facets. Uh, but what I see, so I have come back to India uh, from uh, America in 1984. And we are now in 2019. And the change that I have seen is truly remarkable. Uh, in the next five years, we should be becoming the world's third largest economy after America and China. Japan will then be fourth. Uh, and uh, this is because of what the country is. It is a young, noisy, vibrant democracy. It has the advantage of English. And it has uh, enterprise uh, DNA uh, in our youth. And as you can see, Indians have picked up their bags and gone to almost every country in the world. They have become entrepreneurs, they have done well, and then they come back home. So uh, if you look at our uh, demography, uh, by 2030, over 50% of our population will be below 30 years. Today in India, only 6% of our population is over 65 years old. So we have the opposite problem that you do. We have many, many young men and women who have to come into the workforce and who have to be skilled. Otherwise, we could end up with social unrest. Uh, the statistics require, as per the government, that every month we should bring one million people into the workforce. The truth is we bring two million in every year. So we are creating a workforce gap, a skill set gap of 10 million year on year. And this is, I think, our challenge. So if India has to change for the better, the skilling and the up uh, raising of everybody's uh, educational quota has to increase. So what I have seen is India has become insanely aspirational, insanely aspirational. There is no end to what the young India wants to do. And I always like to give this uh, statistic, which is that every month we add 8 million mobile subscribers every month. That is the power of young India. And with every mobile phone that you add, the world comes into every villager's house where he did not have running water, where he did not have electricity. He now has that, and he has the mobile. And therefore, the earlier mindset of his grandfather, which is that if we are poor, God will reward us in the next life. And we have suffered because we did something wrong in the last life, no longer. Uh, young India wants to get its reward now and not yesterday. And young India 
has a sense of a purchasing power that it never had before, which makes it so attractive to every developed country in the world to access these sort of markets, to access the sort of purchasing power. I had a client once who wanted to have supermarkets in uh, villages. And under the uh, foreign direct investment laws at that time, you were not allowed to have uh, retail uh, investment in foreign, uh, uh, by way of foreign direct investment. So we were putting a paper for the government and we were trying to say, let us do this and let us do that. And uh, I said, let's be reasonable and let us ask the government to allow us to have supermarkets where we have a population of more than 1 million or 500,000, something reasonable. So the government doesn't get worried. So he looked at me and said, Zia, you must be crazy. I want those villages. Those are the people that are going to be spending. And so, if the young villager sees Levi Jeans, which is endorsed by a Bollywood actor, he will save money to buy that, rather than spend money on good food. Now, that is not the best thing, but that is how aspirational India is working. So, if you look at what can make our country grow stronger. One of the ways is good laws to support growth and good laws to support women. At the end of the day, if you look at India's population of women, we are 48.5% of a total population of 1.2 billion. Now, do the numbers, okay? And a lot of these women are not like me, uh, practicing law in a city called Mumbai. A lot of them are in the hundreds of thousands of villages, not yet educated, not yet equal in any shape or form, uh, never really seen a life beyond the household and always followed a very traditional role of being uh, the mother, the wife, um, and then, if you're lucky, a daughter who is educated. But the World Bank has called India's women its lowest hanging fruit. Indian women are the barometer by which our GDP can jump manifold, pretty much like Japan, if you brought more women into your workplace. And what we have done is we have still really not come out of the century-old mindset in the villages of what is a woman's place. Uh, India is still poor. India still has poverty. And today, if you have to choose in a village to feed your boy child or your girl child, you will feed the boy child. And there is therefore a lot of malnourishment amongst the girl child in the villages, which then leads to disease, deformity, and of course, where is then the question of educating? The next thing is, of course, there used to be a lot of maternal mortality. Many women died in childbirth simply because there was no hospitals, no hygiene, no midwives. That has now reduced, as a result of which mothers live longer. And the other thing that happens in India, which very often happens if you don't have an educated society, is that poor people are insecure and want more children. So you give birth to four or five children on an average in a village compared to two or three uh, in a city. Uh, so, so this is what India 
had much more intensely 20 years ago. Today, they still exist, but much less so. And it is important to see how governments have realized that at the end of the day, each woman has a vote. And that you can't take away from her. And today she is standing in line and deciding the future, to some extent, of Indian politics. So today the agenda of law by the government is to enhance the progress of women, protect them from the issues that they have been facing all along, and to make sure that they enter the workplace and add to the national GDP. So today, if you look at it, uh, year on year, the amount of women in the workforce is increasing. The statistics show that between 2016 and 2017, in one year, there was an 11% increase of women in the workforce. That's pretty good. Uh, and if you look at the labor participation by women, that has also significantly increased. In a developing country where the pay difference between a man and a woman is a lot, India has reduced that to a figure that you may find very small, but we think it's great that now women in India on an average are earning 62% of what the men are earning. That is a figure that was maybe 30% or 35% 20 years ago. And more importantly, in the cities, when you come into uh, the classical corporate boardroom, what India has done is it has made law to make participation by women compulsory. Now, there has always been a debate as to whether you should force women to come on boards, whether you should have a quota system, whether you should do it on merit, and that has been an endless debate. Uh, I personally am in favor of this law because I think that if you don't have a law, nobody will do it. Everybody will say, oh, we can't get good women. There are so few women. We want women, but we can't find women. And so all this stops when you have to find the woman. And so now, by law, on listed companies and some unlisted companies, uh, you have to have, in unlisted companies, at least one woman director. And in listed companies on the stock exchange, uh, you have to have at least one independent woman director. So not the wife, not the mother, not the daughter, not the daughter-in-law, but an independent woman director. Now, what this has done is it has basically shot up the participation of women in the boardroom. And the statistics show that globally, the average for women on corporate boards is 15% globally. And India has gone to 12.4%, which is pretty good. Japan is 4.2%. So you need some laws. <laughs> so I always joke, and I don't know if this is an appropriate joke for this audience, but when the men come to me and complain that why are you publicly supporting this law, it's very difficult to find good women, you should not be so open and so noisy about having women on boards. We want women, we really want women, but where are they? And so I often tell them that I'm a lawyer, we run a law firm, and we make a lot of money because of stupid mistakes men make on the board. So go get some women, and maybe you'll do better. 
but I think that uh, in India, what has also helped business um, and law is our IT sector. Uh, we have one of the world's largest and best IT industries. And there, the workforce is nearly 40% women. Uh, and that is uh, a revenue driver. That is the way India has become famous to the world. And that number is growing. There used to be laws in various states that women could not work after six o'clock. And so in the IT industry, you have to work round the clock, at night, three shifts, whatever. So because of the pressure from the companies who needed these women, because 40% is 40%, the states gradually started changing their legislation and allowing women to work at night assure them safe passage back home, et cetera, et cetera. And where do you find women in companies the most? So the statistics show that in India, the highest participation on the boards is in technology, TMT, technology, media, and telecommunications. The next is in the consumer business, and so on and so forth. So women are now simply by example, owning and earning a seat in the workforce simply because they are being given the opportunity. Uh, this leads to many good repercussions. In an emerging country, you are not relevant as much as you should be until you bring money onto the table. And when a woman starts earning, somehow her voice, her choices are much more relevant and listened to. One thing the government has done, this government, is it has forced women to open bank accounts. In India, Nearly, I think, I forget the statistics, but over 85% of our women had no bank accounts. So there was no financial inclusion for women. And on the other hand, the government had billions of dollars in subsidies, which they offered to women for educating the children, buying gas for cooking, cooking gas, and various other subsidies from time to time. Well, what used to happen? The husband used to collect the subsidy and buy alcohol in the village. And the woman could never use that money for what, was, what it was meant to be. So this government went on a drive to basically say, we will not give the woman subsidy until she has a bank account. Simple. So who's going to give up that money from the government? So suddenly you had over 120 million bank accounts opened in two months. So that is India. The scale is staggering. And now it is what is called directed subsidy. So the woman doesn't see cash. She simply sees that money come into her bank account. And she signs. And then she takes out the money. Now, the husband may still force her to do this and that. But at least it's her name on that bank account. And that is a huge change for the empowerment of women through law. Through law. Now, if you look at the market that women represent, and therefore governments, I think, get up and listen. We have, we control uh, globally $20 trillion in global consumer spending. That's what women control. And we earn an approximate $13 trillion. 
So there are studies which show that if you understand the female consumer who now has the power to spend, tapping women as customers improves your success rate as a company by 144%. So the world now needs to understand women because women will spend, because women can earn. And most of this will come from emerging countries like India. Still, they say, the statistics show that over 2.7 billion women are restricted because of circumstances from having the same choices for jobs as men. And that is really one of the things that is not just India, but even developed countries like America or Japan face simply because of a lack of infrastructure. Uh, so, so what are the laws that are changing India in this area? And what are the uh, incentives that India is giving to drive these women back to work? So last year or year before, there is now a law that you are required to pay six months paid leave to every woman by way of maternity leave. And, by the way, she does not have to come back to your job, which is terrible. <laughs> but she is entitled to take six months paid leave to have a child and to stay at home. Now, that is an expensive proposition for corporate India. But it is again one which the government has forced down corporate India simply to make sure that that ability to return to work is left open for the woman. The, the, the law also requires that if you have more than 50 women working for you, you need to make sure that the women who are mothers have a creche facility close by to the workplace. So there was a big debate when this law came out that now men will not hire women. This is, in fact, counterintuitive. This will lead to a chilling effect. Now women will not be eligible for jobs, and this is all very wrong. But I was right, and many women were right, when they took the view that I don't think the world has an option. You cannot do without women in the workplace. And so corporate India just got down to it and started looking out for crashes. In Japan, you have promised more crashes, but they have to come. So we have the, we have the political will, if you like, at least on paper, uh, to push law, to drive women, higher and to make for better business. One of the things that has been an absolute success in India is microfinance. Now microfinance was a model that was started by Dr. Yunus in Bangladesh, but the scale with which it has succeeded in India is staggering. So you have now self-help groups in villages, all women, who borrow $300, $400, if that, and have their little vocational stuff, which they do, and they sell, and they make money. And there is a 99% payback success, no default. And the reason is because if anyone defaults in that self-help group in the village, they don't get more money from the microfinancier. So there's an inbuilt mechanism by which there is no default. And as I said, the woman starts bringing money to the table. Now, when she does that, what is she in a position to do? She is in a position to buy fresh water 
and not go for half a day with a tumbler on her head to a well with stagnant water and come back and lose the whole day. She has a right to tell her husband that her girl child will go to school because she will pay for it. And she has a right to feed her girl child so she doesn't get malnourished. So in these ways, you are seeing a new India emerging with hopefully a higher voice of the girl child than before. And the politics are good because every politician wants the woman's vote. So, you know, we don't have many schools in villages. People have to walk for 10 miles to get to a school and walk back. And when there is food to be cooked and clothes to be washed, um, guess who stays back? The girl. Because there is no time for the mother to allow her to go to school, walk 10 miles, come back, walk 10 miles. So in the state of Bihar, you had a chief minister who wanted the woman's vote. And he did a very smart thing. He said, I will give a bicycle to every girl. And she will cycle to work. The men can walk. The boys can walk. So the girl child suddenly in that state had a percentage of education that suddenly just surged. And of course, like in China, every state has now become competitive. So every other state now wants that same vote and is thinking of ways to have that happen as well. So if you look at what the World Bank has done, over the last few years, the World Bank has given India $3 billion to help empower rural women through these self-help groups. Uh, the World Bank has supported 45 million women of these sort of projects across India. And so, while these numbers sound large to this audience, it's still nothing for us back home. I was telling uh, some of my colleagues today that we represented WhatsApp in India. And uh, WhatsApp wanted to use its application to allow uh, Indians to make payments from the WhatsApp, from the mobile, through the WhatsApp. And we got permission from the Reserve Bank. And overnight, when that was allowed, guess how many people overnight could make payments through WhatsApp? 250 million. So overnight, you enabled financial access to 250 million Indians who were otherwise just exchanging stupid messages on WhatsApp. Again, that's the scale, that's the power, and that is the ability to do things through law and regulation. We have made some good laws which protect women. So like in many emerging countries, uh, there is a lot of sexual harassment in the workplace for women. And so far, that is a very silent, uh, not discussed situation. Uh, today, there is a law uh, which protects the woman, which forces every company to have what they call a committee to investigate complaints, which have a majority of women and which have an independent woman from an NGO. So even though women complaining is still not often because of the centuries of uh, behavior, the ability to do so is now there. So as I say, there is this fear factor. And my mother always taught me that fear is good. You have to love God, but you better fear him as much as you love him. So fear is good. And that's the way legislation starts. So you have, as I said, the maternity benefit. You have the working hours benefit. And you also have, by law, a quota 
for women to be represented on the village uh, authorities, the ruling authorities, what we call the panchayats. So every village has a governing uh, body and there is a mandatory quota of women on that. Now, again, the same story. What do women know? How will women govern? Um, and of course, in the early years, it was very funny because you saw uh, 10 men around the panchayat table and you saw these three women, one third. And behind the three women, you saw their husbands. So, uh, you know, uh, everyone used to say, this is useless. You know, the husband just going to tell the woman what to do. And yes, for the first five years, he may tell the woman what to do. But for the next 50 years, she won't listen. So it's all, and, and India is very incremental. We are an elephant. We move very slowly. Uh, but once we start moving, uh, you can't really stop the pace. So I think that if you look at India 10 years from now, and if I were to come here 10 years from now, I would be giving you different statistics, different successes, and different outcomes. Um, so we've tried to do the best we can uh, in this space. And uh, we have a remarkable confluence of political eagerness, uh, aspirational women, uh, more educated girl child, uh, urbanization, which doesn't allow you to get trapped in the dowry system. Uh, and therefore, the way business and law is encouraging the emergence of the woman as a powerful factor is absolutely fascinating. Now, is there still a cultural issue? I think the answer is yes. So if you're looking at me, I am a rare example of an aggressive woman. Um, many of us are not as talkative. And uh, many of us do not make our voice heard. But now multinationals in India with their subsidiaries are driving diversity. So I was amazed when I got a call from uh, General Electric in India uh, and we had closed a transaction and they were so happy and they couldn't stop thanking me. And I said, well, what's so special about this deal? I mean, what's the story? They said, you don't understand. We've really done well internally because you had all women on your team as a law firm. And so now vendors have to tick the box as to how they do when they go out to their suppliers and whether there is a gender diversity criteria that they have filled. So with this push, and you know, in our law firm, I was telling uh, uh, our colleagues that, and I think in most law firms, we end up starting with 55% women, more women than men. We think they work harder. We think they do better. We think they are more sticky. And we love them. The real trick is how many stay. How many stay. And the real challenge is what is the percentage, as I say, of female partners. So in our firm, I think we've done reasonably well. We have about 36% of our partners are women. And therefore, I think that as a society, and I'd be interested to hear from this audience, about what Japan thinks it can do better to retain more senior women in its workforce. We have the same problems um, and we have the same insecurities. I remember when I came back from America, uh, I was first a barrister. I used to go to court every day. I used to wear a band and a gown and I used to go before the judge and argue and I was terrified because I was maybe one of two women in the Bombay High Court who would be opening their mouth. There would be a lot of women running behind the men, but the women who would go and argue were very few. And guess what? 
the client didn't want to ask a woman to argue his case. Because if something went wrong, it must be because she's a woman. And the instructing lawyer who gave us the brief was always hesitant. Should we brief her? Should we not brief her? Because if something goes wrong, the client will blame us that we hired a woman to argue our case. So life was really tough. Uh, and uh, the only thing you could do was to work harder, uh, work more strategically, uh, be out there all the time. So my father, who was a lawyer, he used to give me some good lessons when I came back to India. And he said, I know you're intelligent. I know you're really good. But, you know, give yourself a better chance. I said, what's that chance, daddy? So he said... You find out what all these men are charging who are your age. And whatever they're charging, you charge 50% less. So I said, you're kidding, right? I mean, equal pay. He's saying, forget equal pay. You just get the visibility. You get the opportunity. And you get the right to be heard and to make yourself, uh, you know, to make yourself effective. So I followed that advice, and I think people like the cheap, hardworking girl. Uh, and so that's really how I got my confidence in my career. And, uh, you know, all of us make mistakes, but it's like, as I always tell my partners, it's like Venus and Mars, you know. If, if a young male lawyer makes a mistake and comes into my room, he's sort of saying, Oh, but, you know, this happened, that happened, this one did this, this one, then that. And if a, a female lawyer comes into my room and she's made a mistake, she's saying, which window can I jump from? You know, I just want to get out of here and jump. So, so I think some things are just DNA. But the way you make it more conscious, more open, more available uh, for the workforce to be expanded in this extremely positive way is by legislation and, of course, a change in culture. So again, I would be interested to hear what is Japan's experience. In India, we still have the C-suite absolutely dominated by men. And as I always say today, our main mentors are not going to be women. They are going to be our men. Because if we have five women, we have 95 men. And so who is really going to make the difference? And who is going to help achieve the change? And therefore, the, the brainwashing, if you like, is not for women. Women already believe all this. It's for the men. And in India, we have a culture, and I don't know about Japan, where it's very awkward for the woman to go and talk to her male boss and say, I need this or I need that. Um, you feel very embarrassed, you feel slightly ashamed, uh, you really don't have a discussion, and you just leave quietly. And the male boss doesn't know why you've left because he's not thought about it. Uh, so really, what we are trying to do, well, what I try and shout every time I can, is to have our CEOs, our CFOs, our senior leadership actually understand that what is required is a conversation. And every conversation may not be great, but it is better than no conversation. And very often the things you need to do to retain women is so simple. It's so basic and so elementary. But nobody's thought of it because nobody's had the conversation. So our culture is still got a long way to go. We still have uh, an inability to retain our workforce. You know, the World Bank called India, called its women, not only the lowest hanging fruit, but India has a leaky pipeline. That was the phrase the World Bank used. And the leaky pipeline is because 48.5% of our women drop out from the workforce. So however many come in, that many go out. So the stairs are very, very few. 
So if you look at our population, you've got, you know, half our population, 48% of our population is women, 600 million. 48% of that, let's say 400% are in the workforce or 300% are in the workforce. You've got 150 million dropping out of the workforce before they can realize their full careers. So I think that now where we've seen, um, and the Sahanis would be interested, we have um, recruitment firms actually now scouting for women. The mandate is, oh, I need a woman, oh, I need a woman. I get a million calls to say, do you know any good women you can recommend? And I have a little file in my office and my secretary adds to that file every time I give her a name. And I have a women's file. So every time they call up, I say, wait a minute. I'll get my secretary saying, open that file, just show me that file. And I'll give some names. And one step at a time, these women, if they prove themselves, they will then bring other women into that space. And small steps can lead to good results. So I think that what should happen, and at least in a corporate culture, what should drive it is nothing is done if you request. Everything has to have an outcome if you don't do it. And so I think that the best way, the easiest way, is for companies to set themselves KRAs. And middle management has to have a KRA that they have to retain a certain amount of their middle management as women. They have to find ways not to let them go, not 100%, whatever percentage the company suggests. And in this way, you will build up your permanent woman, female workforce in a way that you can monitor it with certain metrics. And you can then see the change that happens. This is what this idea came to me. It wasn't mine. There was a lady who was the CEO of a global mining company called Anglo-American. Strange uh, for a female to be a CEO of a global mining company. And we were chatting, she was down in India. And I was saying, you know, we lose middle, middle management women. And she says, no, no, no. I have told all my managers, whether they are women managers or male managers, if they cannot retain X percent of women, they lose money. They lose money. So, and if they need help to keep those women, they come to me and I can help them. But if at the end of the year, they haven't met that percentage, they lose money. So I think that I would be very interested to see what the Japan experience is. But today you have flexible hours. You have a government policy, as I was uh, saying earlier, uh, to Yamada-san, where the government, if you are a woman employed by the government, and India, the largest employer is the government, right? So the women there have a right for two years paid leave, two years paid leave at any time of their career. If they want six months when they have a baby, no problem. They want six months when the child is giving their exams, no problem. They want six months when their daughter is getting married, no problem. So they can choose the two years of their life, but they will be paid for two years by virtue of being a woman in government employment. Not many know of this, but that's how it works. So I think that pretty much that comes to the end of my 45 minutes. Uh, I must tell you that there is a bank called ICICI Bank in India, which used to be run by a woman CEO. And they have a, a unique program, which is called ICICI India's I Work at Home program. I Work at Home program. And this is apart from the usual maternity policy. So there is a drive to keep women in the financial sector, in the IT sector, simply because they constitute such a large bulk of the important population of such an important sector. Um, I'm not sure I need to talk right now, Yamada-san, about the differences in 
business approach between India and Japan, maybe that can come up in questions. That was one of the topics I was asked to talk about. Uh, except that, uh, to conclude, the, the, the realization is that India is noisier, more expressive, they wave their hands a lot. Uh, the Japanese are patient, long-term, trusting. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a story that I always tell where I was negotiating opposite an American lawyer. And he suddenly took the pen and he banged the f uh, pen on the table and he says, stop it, Zia. And I said, what did I do? What do you mean, stop it? He was really angry with me. He says, you're saying no to everything I say. I said, where did I say no? He's saying, you keep doing this. I said, this means yes, I'm agreeing with you. So <laughs> in India, when we say yes, we go like this. And he thought I was saying no to everything possible. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes things get lost in translation. But anyway, on that happy note, I'm so happy to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you. Very happy to take questions. あの、今日のお話をされてましてですね、あの、やっぱり雇用の問題、そしてその雇用の問題を解決するっていうのがおそらく多分女性のですね、え、役割と言いますか。え、切り札なんじゃないかというふうに今思いました。あの、大体インド
要するに投資の呼び込みですとか、えー、インフレ抑制、これ、非常にうまくいっております、あのー、消費者物価指数も2年ぶりぐらいの低水準になってきておりますし、まあ、汚職もモデさん自身、非常にきれい、あのー、クリーンな方ですし、えー、大きな、まあ、汚職、案件は起きていません、えー、税制、えー、タックス、タックスですね、タクセーション、えー、GST も導入しました、そして一番下、えー、バンクラプシープロセーディング、まあ、いわゆる企業の破綻処理、これもようやく法律ができまして、まあ、軌道に乗り始めた。まあ、ただただ、えー、案件に比べてベンチ、法廷の数がまだ少なすぎるので、なかなかです、ね、スピードが上がらないという状況はありますが、えー、これは非常にうまくいっています。その一方で、やはり雇用の創出、そして農村、まあ、ルーラルディストレスというです、ねあのー、言葉が今、あのインドの政治を語る上でキーワードになっておりますが、この問題だけはまだモディ政権5年間で、えー、完全には解決できておりません。そして、えー、これもです、ね、ご参考までに、あの今、我々が非常に関心を持っています、インドの、まあ、ビジネス関連法ですね、でしかも、まあ、多少トラブっているというところ、えー、一番上、ランドアクイジションアクトというのがございまして、これが土地収容法です。えー、これが非常にあの改正されましてです、ね、政権交代の間際に、まあ、要するに土地を買うコストが2倍から4倍ぐらいに膨れ上がってしまって、これが、まあ、あのプロジェクト、工業プロジェクトとかインフラを作るのに際して、ちょっと、まあ非常にあの大きな障害になっているという点です。で、これが実はモディ政権あのちょっと前に大統領令をまああの交付してまあそれでこの短期的に法律を改正するというアプローチを行ったんですが、これがまあ。時間切れになってしまいましてうまくいっておりませんそしてレーバーローズまあ労働法というのがありましてこれが非常にいっぱいあります中でも有名なのが産業紛争法1947年なんと70年以上の前の法律が残ってましてこれがもう皆さんご存知かと思います100人以上雇っている会社は首を切れないという単純なそういう法律なんですけれどもこれが残っているおかげでまあ企業やはりあの景気が悪くなってくると人を調雇用調整するといったことができにくくなっておりますまあただこれも今インド政府がまあ、このあまたある40個ぐらいあるですねえ労働法をまあ4つのグループに分けてコンソリデートしようというところも方向性は打ち出しておりますただ選挙前ですのでえ現状ではちょっとストップしているという感じですそして3番目まあこれが先ほどあのお伝えしましたあのお話ししましたえいわゆるえ債務超過破産法ということでえ企業の破綻処理を迅速に進めるという法律ですまあこの,あの3つをとりあえず今日ですねえ皆さん方にご参考までにお伝えしておきますこれがまあ非常に今,今注目されていますえインドのまあ著名な法律でございますそして、ちょっと心配な点がいくつかあります、2月の1日に発表されました2019年度の暫定予算という形になるんですが、まあ、これで,です、ね、いわゆる高知面積2ヘクタール以下の零細農家に対して、6000ルピー年間、現金給付、まあ、いわゆるばらまきを行うということを発表しました。6000ルピーといって、まあ、日本円円でで円ぐらいなんですけれども、えーまあえー、貧しいといいますかです、ね、マージナルな、えー、農家にとっては、まあ、かなりあの助けになるということは言えます。で、えー、こ,のこのほかにもです、ねあのー、零細企業への金利補助ですとか、さまざ、あ、まな、あのーまあ、貧しい人、農村、えー、農民に優しい、えー、政策というものを打ち出しております。そして、えーナレンドラ・モディ首相なんですけれども、まあ、これはまあほんの予告編だみたいなことをです、ねえー、言っておりまして、おそらく選挙が近づいてくると、まあ、第2弾、第3弾のです、ねまあ、いわゆる人気取り政策みたいなものを打ち出してくる可能性もあります。で、その結果、財政赤字がまあ膨らんでどうなるのか、ルピーアスにつながらないのかっていう、ちょっと心配な点がございます。ただその反面、えーインドついこの間ですね、利下げに踏み切りました、4月にも追加利下げをやるという可能性が今、支えかれておりまして、これが当然、利下げですから、ローンの金利も下がりますし、自動車の、まあえー、ローンも金利も下がって、購買増に結びつくんじゃないかと、まあ、要するに成長優先ですね、という政策を、まあ、打ち出しております。でちょっと心配なのが、えー、ご存知のようにカシミールをめぐるインドとパキスタンの紛争という状況なんですが、これ、私、個人的には、まあ、あの結構楽観しておりますで実際今、ようやくそう、まあまあ、モディさんも振り上げた拳をです、ね、少し、まあ、ちょっと真ん中辺ぐらいまで下ろして、まあ、話し合いに応じそうな、えー、雰囲気が出ています。でこれもちろんえー、紛争が続いて緊張が高まって、えー、投資が来なくなって景気が悪くなってしまったら場合はです、ねまあ、困るのは双方パキスタンもそうですしインドもそうなんで、まあ、徐々に、えー、緊張緩和に動いていくのではないかというふうにあの私は思っております。で最後、えー、もう一個ですね、え
このソーシャルパティシペーション、インディア・ウィメンというお話があります、ここにありますように、まあ、残念ながらあのマスターカードの調査で、インドのです、ねまあ、女性のいわゆるまあ社会進出指標というのがです、ね、アジアの主要の国、地域の中ではちょっと低い、最下位という状況になっております。ちなみに指数だけ単純にお知らせ、あのお伝えいたしますとです、ね、オーストラリアが 83.3。中国が 73.3、日本が 64.8 というスコアなんですね、これはあのオーナーシップ、企業のオーナーシップとか労働参加を指数化してランキングするんですけれども、インド 48.4 ということで、ちょっとかなり低い数字が残念ながら出ております。そして、あのモディさんのこの2番目のところで,です、ね、コメントがあります。まあ、この企業の民間企業で女性をですね、まあ、いわゆるそのリザーベーション、あの枠を、女性採用枠をまあ設けようという議論に対して、森、まあ、さんおっしゃった言葉要するに、人に言われて強制的に雇うのではなく、やはり能力がある女性を雇ってほしいというのが、この森さんの発言です。そしてもう一個、あの下にございます、これもあの同じオ、えー、ケージョンで行われたあの話、話されたことなんですけれども、まあ、要するに、女性を男性と同じように、えー、ですね、登用すると、インドの GDP GDP がですね、2050年までに6割上がる、まあ、これはいや若干大げさかもしれませんが、あのー、やはり女性の活用がイン,ドインド経済の成長を大きく後押しする、これはまああの間違いないというふうに考えていいんじゃないかと思います。そして、まあ、これが先ほど、ちょっと、あの、森さんからもお話がありました、えー、労働参加率の指数、まあ、インド減っているというよりは、まあ、思ったほど伸びていないという理解で正しいかと思います。まあ、26% ぐらいということで、えー、まあ、4人に1人ぐらいしか働いていないという状況で、様々な、もちろんバックグラウンドが考えられます。やはり、女性は結婚を機に家庭に入らなきゃいけないというような社会的プレッシャーですとか、やはりこの製造業を中心とした、まあ、男社会といいますかですね、そういった構図、そしてもちろんその今まで女性の主要な働きでありました農村、農業セクターにおいても、機械化や合理化によって、そもそも雇用自体が減っている、まあ、こういったさまざまな状況があの今あるやに言われております。で女性の場合やはり高学歴化するとということでまず、えー、若年の女性のです、ね、労働者が減るそしてじゃあ、えー、高学歴を身につけていざ労働市場に出ていこうと思ってもそのスキルに見合うジョブがなかなかないというですねあのこういう構図が指摘されております、えー、こういったですねあの今非常に難しい状況であのもちろんいくつかの対策政策取られておりますけれどもやはりまだまだあの時間がかかる民間に任せるだけではなくやはり何と言いますか政策的なアプローチが必要なのではないかというのがちょっとこの私の意見でございます。あの本日は非常にあの本当に女性や雇用の問題だけじゃなく非常に幅広いテーマでですねあのモデさんに語っていただきましてあの私も大変勉強になりました本当にありがとうございました皆さん盛大な拍手をお願いいたします